Uh, my name's Katie, and I am a mathematician. Uh, one of the things I find most fascinating about maths is the fact that it is made up of ideas. It's just this bunch of ideas and concepts and structures and things that are kind of, the way I see it, just sort of floating out there in the universe, waiting for someone to come and discover them and play with them and do something interesting with them. And what this means is that the same mathematical idea, the same piece of maths, can be picked up and played with by many different mathematicians all over the world and throughout time as well. An example of this uh, is this piece of maths here, which is from China in 1303. And you can see there are numbers in there. If I show you what those numbers are, uh, you can see this is a, a triangle of numbers that are arranged with a pattern. So each number is the sum of the two numbers above it. You've got four is three plus one, and six is three plus three. And you might see this, you know, you might have seen this before, potentially at school, but you may not know this as the Yanghui Triangle. You might think of this as being called Pascal's Triangle, uh, and that's because that's what it's called. Uh, but Pascal wasn't born until the 17th century. So this triangle actually existed several hundred years before Pascal. And in fact, it even existed before that. This is the exact same structure uh, from uh, the year 900. Um, and in fact, this kind of thing happens all the time. Mathematical ideas get kind of picked up by different people in different places. And what I'd like to do is tell you the story of one particular piece of maths uh, that goes from a uh, very long time in the past all the way through to the modern day. Um, and it's based on a simple idea. So here I have uh, some cans. And I could use these cans if I wanted to kind of create a display for my supermarket where I sell cans uh, to create a nice little display like this, a little kind of triangular shape like that. And uh, a, a reasonable question you might ask yourself if you're building this kind of shape is, how many cans do I need to build different sizes of, of stack? You know, if I've got four rows here, I've got one plus two plus three plus four cans. In general, what do these numbers do? What's the pattern in these numbers? And you might reasonably see that this is, you know, one plus two plus three plus four, um, and you could calculate them this way. So if I've got, uh, you know, different numbers of cans in my pyramid, uh, this is how I could calculate them. But you can also see that if I take the one can from the top row and add it to the four cans from the bottom row, I get five. And if I take the two and add it to the three, I also get five. And this is not a coincidence. This happens with any size of stack that you use. If you've got numbers that increase like this, you take the top one and add it to the bottom one, you get the same thing as if you add the second to top one to the second to bottom one, because one of them's gone up and the other one's gone down, so you get the same total. So you can do this all the way down to the middle, and it means that you can pair up all the numbers. So you have pairs of numbers, each of which adds up to one more than the biggest number, and you have the number of pairs is half the number uh, of layers in your stack. So in this case, I've got four layers, so I've got four divided by two pairs, that's two, and I've got four plus one is five in each pair. Two times five is 10 cans. And I knew that because these are my cans. But if I had a stack that was, say, 20 cans high, I would have 20 plus one, 21 cans in each pair, and 20 divided by two is 10 pairs of cans. So I'd have 210 cans altogether. And that means I've got a pattern for this. I know that the number of cans divided by two times the number of cans plus one will always give me the total number of cans. And this is the way that you see this formula often written. And if I wanted to do this for something more interesting, so not just a flat triangle of cans, if I wanted to make kind of a 3D pyramid, I could do this as well. So I have one can on the top. Underneath that, I have four cans arranged in a square. Underneath that, I have nine cans arranged in a square, um, and so on and so forth. And there is a general pattern for this as well. If I want to know how many cans I use altogether, uh, it's this. And it's a bit more complicated than the first one, but it still gives you a general rule. And if I wanted to go on further than this, because of course, of course, mathematicians always do. I could have one can on top. I don't know why I would do this, but I could have a two by two by two cube of cans underneath that, and then a cube that's three by three by three cans underneath that. Um, this is now just the sum of the cube numbers. And there is a general formula for this as well, and it looks like this. And these kinds of ideas have been thought about for a very long time. People have played with this particular bit of maths since a very, very long time ago. So, for instance, Pythagoras 
You may, have, you may be familiar with Pythagoras' greatest hits, uh, but the followers of Pythagoras were known to arrange pebbles in triangles on the floor to try and work out how many you could get in a, in a triangle shape like this. So they were looking at these kinds of questions. Uh, this is a mathematician from around about 1,000 years later uh, from India, and Aryabhata is widely considered one of the first physicists, uh, and he knew that pi was 3.1416, which is pretty good for the time. Uh, and Aryabhata also considered these formulae, the, the sums and the sum of squares and the sum of cubes. And uh, this is a mathematician called Al-Kharaji, who was based in Baghdad, uh, again, another 500 years later, uh, also uh, worked on this particular type of mathematics, and also discovered Pascal's triangle several hundred years before Pascal. Uh, it was quite a popular thing to do. Um, but at the time, maths was done in a quite a different way to the way that it's done now. So they wouldn't necessarily have had these formulae in the same form that we're familiar with. So this is from Aryabhata's writing on the topic. Um, and it's, it's quite dense. There's a lot going on here, but I'll put up the equation as well so you can see uh, what's going on here. Um, the sixth part, that's the, the six on the bottom, of the product of three quantities consisting of the number of terms, that's n, the number of terms plus one, that's n plus one, and twice the number of terms plus one is the sum of the squares. So this is kind of a word version of that same uh, mathematical formula. And at the time, this was the way that people did mathematics. We didn't have this kind of algebraic notation that we use today. So I guess the next person to come into this story is going to be the first person to write down these formulae properly, I guess, in a, in a, a numerical form. Uh, and that was a mathematician called Thomas Harriot, who was also a, a map maker and a navigator and a translator and an ethnographer. Uh, and one of the things that he did was write down uh, these equations. So you had the sum of numbers, the sum of squares, the sum of cubes. Uh, and the one in the bottom corner there is the sum of fourth powers. Um, so the, the pattern carries on. Um, and the next person who comes along is this mathematician, Johannes Faulhaber, who was from Germany, and he wrote down formulae for the first 17 powers, uh, which sort of feels like maybe there's something kind of general here. Maybe we could actually get a formula for any power. If I, if I choose how many dimensions my supermarket display is going to be in, uh, I can then work out how many cans I'm going to need. Uh, and the person that is uh, the next person that kind of comes along in this story is a mathematician called Jacob Bernoulli. And what Bernoulli realized was that these formulae can be rewritten so that they all look very similar. So instead of saying n over 2 times n plus 1, you can spread it out so that you've got uh, the sum of first powers, I guess the sum of numbers, is a half n plus a half n squared. This is just the same equation, but rewritten. And if I write the sum of the squares, I get a similar thing. I've got an, a fraction in front of an n, a fraction in front of an n squared, and a fraction in front of an n cubed. Uh, and I can do this for all of them. You just end up with more and more powers of n. In this case, there's no fraction in front of the n because it's zero. Uh, but you get a sequence of numbers. And these numbers essentially tell you what these formulae are. And Bernoulli discovered a way to find these numbers, a pattern in these numbers that meant that you could create these formulae. And what Bernoulli found was a set of numbers which we call the Bernoulli numbers. That's the, the next bunch there. Quite a lot of them are something over six. That's, we don't know why. Uh, so these are the Bernoulli numbers. And these are a, a set of fractions. Again, a lot of them are zero. Uh, there are a lot of patterns in these as well. But Bernoulli realized that if you take these numbers and combine them with some numbers from Pascal's triangle, it turns out, you can generate those fractions, which means you can create these formulae for any power that you like. And you can also generate the Bernoulli numbers. And in order to create the Bernoulli numbers, you need the previous Bernoulli number. So you've got the first one, which is 1. Uh, you can then work out the second one. You can then use those two to work out the third one, and so on. Um, now, we caught the Bernoulli was very smug about this discovery. Uh, he, he said, uh, with the help of this table, it took me less than half of a quarter of an hour uh, to find that the 10th powers of the first 1,000 numbers being added together will yield the sum this, uh, which is quite impressive. You know, this is definitely a step forward, and it's a brilliant discovery, uh, although potentially not necessarily Bernoulli was the first person to discover this. Uh, as always, uh, this is a mathematician from Japan, Seki Takakazu, who discovered these numbers and published about a year before Bernoulli did. Uh, but for some reason, they're called the Bernoulli numbers. So who knows? Anyway, um, this could be, in some sense, the end of the story because we have an answer to this question. In general, if I want to build any number of stacks in any number of dimensions, how many cans do I need? I can work out the Bernoulli numbers, and then I can work out the formula using them. 
but it's not quite the end. Um, and the next person who comes along with this particular bit of maths uh, is a person called Ada Lovelace. Um, and she's a very, very famous uh, example of someone who's connected, potentially, uh, if you've heard of her, you might have heard of her in the context of computing. Uh, because Ada Lovelace worked with this machine, uh, and I should qualify, this is not the entire machine, this is one small part of the machine, and the whole thing was never actually built. So technically, Ada Lovelace worked with an imaginary computer that never really existed. This is just kind of one small bit of it. Uh, and it was designed by Charles Babbage, and Ada was brought in to uh, help with some of the writing up of this. So she understood how this machine worked. Uh, she was translating some papers and wrote a big appendix on the end just to show what this machine could do. And it was, again, a hypothetical thing, but you could program this machine to do anything. So you, you kind of you controlled it using a punch card system, so a bit like the jacquard looms of the time. You would punch some holes in a thing, feed it into the machine, and it would run a program, and it could calculate, in theory, anything you wanted it to. And Ada wanted to show off what this machine was capable of doing, and she wrote this program. And the title up there, is a diagram for the computation by the engine of the numbers of Bernoulli. So this was the thing that she did. This was the piece of mass that she chose to show off using what could potentially have been the very first ever computing machine. Um, and you, you know, this has got in it the Bernoulli numbers. There's a, there's a little B0 and a B1 popping out there on the right and a B2. And you can see that it is code for generating the numbers. And I'm incredibly impressed by this because this was a computer program that was written for a computer that didn't actually exist. You can't debug this. Right? This is just, this is so impressive. Um, and she, it happened that she picked this particular bit of mass. It was something that she'd been playing around with herself to try and calculate the numbers um, to actually show what this could do. And I don't think this is the end of the story either, because um, the Bernoulli numbers connect to various other bits of maths as well. So uh, there's a piece of maths called the Riemann hypothesis, which is currently one of the most famous outstanding problems in mathematics. Um, if you can solve the Riemann hypothesis, there is a prize of a million dollars available to the mathematician that first solves it, uh, which makes it quite an exciting prospect. Uh, but it does connect to this same piece of maths. So if someone were to make progress with that, they might potentially be the next person in this story story as well. But I think what this has shown me, I, I don't normally talk about mathematicians this much, I mostly just talk about maths, but I thought it was interesting to think about the people who did this. Because these mathematical ideas that float around in the universe just waiting for someone to come along, without mathematicians, that's all they are, they're just ideas. And until someone comes and, and grabs it and plays with it and uses it to do something interesting or useful, uh, it will only ever just be an idea. Thank you very much. <laughs>